State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and date and place of birth, please? William H. Balls, <coughs> B-A-L-L-S, uh, September 14th, 1925, in a uh, Port Chester Hospital in Port Chester, New York. Did you attend school in Port Chester? No, right. It was a community hospital there, you know. The okay. Where I didn't have a hospital, but it was all three communities go to this big hospital. And uh, did you graduate from high school? Yes. What year did you graduate? 1943. And when you went into the service, uh, did, did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted. And when were you drafted? Uh, right after my birthday, September 40, 43. Okay. And you were drafted into the Army? Yes. Whereabouts? Oh, let me just go back a little bit. Do you recall where you were and what your reaction was uh, when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Uh, we were in class, I believe it was, uh, it was a sophomore in Wright High School. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, pretty much an element of surprise. And uh, the idea was we were, we were going to take care of those people pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Did you notice if your, your life really changed at that point? with uh, shortages, rationing, uh, anything like that? Not too much. Mm -hmm. No, not too much. My life didn't change much until after I got into the service. I, summer times I was a lifeguard at a private country club and I did a lot of caddying too uh -huh. during, during the spring and the fall. Did you participate in any kind of scrap drives or anything while you were in high school? I think that there was a shortage of metals, mm -hmm. and one of the uh, one of the guys in my class set up a group, and there was a, like a one 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 day collection, uh -huh. all the scrap that they could find in town, and bring it to one little depot they had set up. Yes, all right, we did that. Okay, so you were drafted into the army in 1943, and that was in October. Whereabouts did they send you for your basic training? Uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Was that your first time away from home? I'd say yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was basic training like? Uh, it was pretty rigid. We had a, a sergeant that was keeping an eye on everyone, and uh, we had people from all over the area mm -hmm. in this in this group, and I think it was... Uh, a, they called it A, A group, and I was the guide on in the group. Okay, any idea why you were picked to be guide on? I have no idea. He okay. just said to me, "Hey, Walt, I want you to." What you know, we're from marching around mm -hmm. with different exercises we were doing. Okay. And he said, "You pulled me out of a lot of these things. You're the guide on." Okay. <laughs> when you attended basic training, was there? Anybody there that you knew from, from back home at all? No, no, no? not at all. all right. Once your basic training uh, was completed, did you go on to any advanced schooling at all? No, I did not. Okay, so you were, you were trained as an infantryman? No, I was trained as an artillery on, 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 on radio. Right, but I mean, it, through base, you, you completed your basic, it was basic infantry school. Yes. And, and then uh, you went into the artillery. Yes. Was it on the job training for that? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. No, no previous at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they didn't send you to any sort of artillery school? No. Okay. It was on the job as you mentioned. All right. Now when they sent you to this unit, whereabouts was that? Sent us. It was in Old Camp Chaffee, Arkansas. I right. believe that was in Arkansas. Yes. All right. Camp Chaffee. And how long were you there for? Well, approximately. I'm trying to just reflect now between the time we left there and we overseas. I'd say it's a, at least three or four months. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of training at that time too. We had the uh, these cats pulling the guns around. And, the Canadians were doing their thing and we were doing supposedly OP work and things of that nature. Now what does OP stand for? Observation Post. Okay. 
And when you went overseas, did you go over as a, as a division? Is, did the whole unit go over together? The battalion went over together and we sailed on to Queen Elizabeth and went up to Firth Clyde into Scotland. Mm -hmm. We were experienced gun people, they said, and they had, there was a number of guns on the, on the promenade deck on the Queen Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And our, our, our guys at A Battery were assigned to guns and we had a pretty good uh, sleeping arrangement on the, on the, prom, on the promenade, uh, promenade area, promenade deck. Mm -hmm. It wasn't bad duty at all okay. compared to the troops down below. Now, now when did you cross? When did you go across? It had to be. We went, we went in, into into France, and went, I think it was in October. Uh -huh. yeah. it's we went across in, in, in late September, okay. or mid September, let's say mid September. Yeah, mid September, yes. And you landed in Scotland? In Scotland, in Glasgow. We went up to Further Plain, and we can mm -hmm. see the Scots walking along the hills. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I guess it was a tradition for those people at that time. How long were you in Scotland for? Did you do any training there? No, we didn't. Uh, we were there just maybe a day or two days to get the battalions on trains and then on into, into England. Okay. And when you got to England, was there more training? Yes, there was. Yeah. Okay. There was a big area there where it, Certain certain type guns trained here, and certain infantry and the mechanics and tanks trained in another big area. It was an area I, I think it was called Christ Church. Okay. And was the 81st Artillery Battalion was was that part of a bigger division? Uh, no, we weren't. We were a loose battalion. Okay. A single unit. We were attached afterward when we got over. You'll see in the in the book there we were attached to a couple of different divisions right. once we started moving into France. Okay. Do you recall when you went into France? I think it was... Uh, wait a minute. What's the date in the book there? <laughs> That's cheating, you know. Wait a minute. Where did you land in France, Terry? Yes. Did I did I write it down there? I didn't have it down there, huh? Uh, I, I thought it was around uh, around September. In September, sometime because I had my my 19th birthday in France. Okay, so th so that would have been uh, 1944. Yes. Okay. 1944. All right. Yep. September. Yeah, and that was right before the the uh, winter. Yeah, the winter takeoff. Yeah. August, you sailed from New York. From New York, August. And you, it just says September, you landed on Omaha Beach. Okay. All right. Now, uh, when was the first time you you came under fire? It was in in uh, I think. It was in Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. Yes, that would be the first stop. Was in Luxembourg near near the Moselle River, mm -hmm. and uh, we started getting some shelling in there for a while. Mm -hmm. And a short time, we were there in a defensive position mostly. And a short time later, that's when von Rundstedt started his push, mm -hmm. and we were cut off, completely cut off. It was about a week, 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 week before Christmas. Okay. I believe that year. And in order to get out of there, Patton's tanks sent tanks in and escorted out of that out of that area. Mm -hmm. And then we were attached to the Thermal Third Army, I think, from there on. We went right into battle then, right after that. Okay. Do you want to describe what that was like being in battle? Um, that was your first time under under heavy Yeah, heavy heavy fire. Okay. It was uh, it was pretty scary mm -hmm. for a young guy that had never mm -hmm. been exposed to anything like that. It was very scary, and at the, at the same time, you you learned you had to keep your head mm -hmm. and keep thinking of what you're supposed to be doing, and not just you know some people didn't didn't handle it too well. You could see 
and surrounding groups and different companies. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to be pretty, pretty much concentrating and know what you were doing and, st and stay with it. Mm -hmm. Now, what exactly was your job at that point? What, what was, what were you doing? Each ba each battery had a couple of units that were called the OP people. There was mm -hmm. a team of three: a lieutenant, a guy with a BC scope, and a radio man. Mm -hmm. And we would find they they, they all had maps, all the same maps in the headquarters that G G two sent to all the batteries and all the lieutenants and that we had with us. Mm -hmm. And then we started an observation post, okay. but finding areas where we will not be exposed into the, the sky. We had to have dark backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, those tiger tanks would start picking you up pretty, pretty fast. They had they were fierce. Mm -hmm. They were very tough guns on those 88 millimeters on those tanks. Yeah. And that's when we first started doing some work. You're looking for targets that were troop, troop movements, tanks, rail cars, or any kind of supply, mm -hmm. railroads and so forth like that. And when a target was spotted, we'd radio back to the G2 at battalion headquarters. And they would determine, from the maps were identical, okay, mm -hmm. to take, to take, take a shot or two, find out how far it is, give us a read on it, and then we'll decide whether you want you to pick the target, start shooting, or just one or two rounds out there until we could bring in some additional help if it mm -hmm. was a large target. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you'd have, okay, battery, uh, A battery, you do this, B battery, you do that, to the left or to the right, or over or under, and concentrate on getting rid of that target, killing that target. Mm -hmm. What did you do? Well, I was up on the OP with the radio for our okay. lieutenant. And, and then we would radio back what, what we saw. We'd yeah. have big, big, big scopes, you know, how they pull them. And we had a couple of pair of these five five power glasses mm -hmm. and you could see quite a quite a distance out and he could he would report back on the radio that I had and, you, and you'd have to relay the coordinates that's right to, we, for the, the uh, coordinates. Artillery. we had a map of the same coordinates mm -hmm. back to them so they knew exactly where we were what we were doing mm -hmm. yeah so you were on the move quite a bit yeah we didn't stay too long in, in one place because mm -hmm. if something happened then you, you felt you were exposed there was one occasion I think in the maybe four or five weeks later, when all of a sudden we heard these, these overhead shells coming in, and, and the lieutenant says to me, Paul, get the hell out of here. So I went back down, rolled back down over to the hill, and where we had this OP set up, it was destroyed. Mm -hmm. They had they had a spot, I don't know the hell they did, I don't know, mm -hmm. somebody may have gotten up and shown, you know, a, a silhouette of what they picked up. But the radio wasn't damaged. I, I, I managed to push it in a foxhole as I was rolling it down. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing hurt more than everybody's pride we were spotted. That wasn't a good thing for us at all. What about uh, casualties? Did your group suffer? No, not too night? much, no. No, okay. we had, let's see, one, two, three, and the first couple of weeks we were out there. We were all big, big people. Uh, other batteries had a minimum because the, the positions had been come under fire, mm -hmm. the shell fire. And there were a, a, a small number in that area, but the, it, it didn't, not too many casualties, it was, wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, you were out in all kinds of weather, especially the cold weather, the snow and that. What about... Uh, your personal clothing and equipment they gave you was was it satisfactory or? Uh, yeah, yeah. We had the regular. You had your your ODs. You had the your work clothes and uh, big, 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 big overcoats mm -hmm. and boots. The wool hat, which we got under the uh, under our steel helmets. Mm -hmm. Yes. And mittens, but sometimes you know they get the weighted. Just make sure you didn't lose it. Mm -hmm. And everybody had a sleeping bag. Okay. What about frostbite? Is that a problem? Uh, it yeah. Eventually, it did. On on my feet for a short time afterward. When I come home, I got treated for it, and I 
no, nothing. Uh -huh. no, I didn't want to do anything about it. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. Now, what about a change of clothing or, or socks? Well, a change of clothing, we didn't do that too often because we weren't indoors that much. Occasionally, if we found a, a, a everything was in the Jeep that we owned, most of, most of our clothing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We found a farmhouse where we would try to change our clothes. Mm -hmm. And you didn't change, you know, the old stuff was so bad and uh, in, in need of uh, laundering, by hand. you didn't want to keep it around. <laughs> so that's pretty much what we did. I, I heard that uh, they really stress changing your socks every day. You take the oh, yes. socks off I and forgot put that. it next to your body. And that's right. Keep it warm. Mm -hmm. Put them back on. Oh yeah. You always slept with your shoes on. Mm -hmm. And why, why is that? Well, in case you had to move in a hurry. Okay. In case that you had to get up and go, you know. <laughs> you don't say, where's this, where's that? <laughs> but the, I, we, I, I always had it in my knapsack. I always had a, maybe four or five pair of socks all uh -huh. the time. We managed to pick them up on different units that we were attached to. It. The supply people would give, give them to us, mm -hmm. whoever we were attached to at the time. Okay. Now, what about food? Very little hot food, unless we were coming back and ran into a, a, uh, an area where the mess sergeant had set up a kitchen. Most of the time, we were on C rations and K rations. Mm -hmm. And they had one of these little uh, stoves, what do you call them? Oh, I know what you mean. One of those little single burner. Yeah, one of those single burners, and you and you yeah. could heat up, heat up some uh, can of beans or something or like that. And you could also uh, you, you use your your your, uh, your cup, your, your dip, canteen your, cup, your canteen cup. Put the, put the coffee in there, mm -hmm. strong and black, in water, and uh, that's pretty much what what was par for the course all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, how long were you out on line typically for? Well, it depended on how, how, how the, the, where we were and what, what we were doing and how it was, what was progressing on our area. Mm -hmm. Mostly, mostly uh, three days, maybe no more than four. Mm -hmm. And they tried to get us back to get us some warm food and we were relieved. Mm -hmm by backup teams from our, from our own battery. Okay. There were three groups. The first group got pretty well beat up, and that's where, that was our first casualty. I think I told you that, yeah. That was in, in Luxembourg? Yeah. Okay. And were you in Holland at all, too, or? No. Just uh, Luxembourg. France Belgium. and Germany? Okay. You want to tell us about um, what, what it was like in France? Is that... Uh, any better for you than, than Luxembourg? Not, not really. There was more, uh, there was more fighting, fighting going on in France because I remember it was one occasion we were, we were in a, a small convoy moving our battalion up to join, to join a, uh, another group, and this big tall sergeant in an intersection in Metz. Mm -hmm was there directing traffic and I was driving the Jeep with the lieutenant with me and all of a sudden I hear this voice, hey Bill, what the hell are you doing here? It's my cousin Neil oh. from Rye, New York. He was a sergeant on the MPs. Huh. Yeah, that was, a, that was a very strange but very good day. He said, I know exactly where you're going. I'll see you a little later when it gets dark. And he came out with two bottles of champagne. So we lit two bottles of champagne with a couple of friends of mine and he, he stayed there until we finished it. Huh. He wanted to make sure we were going to get, not going to give it away. <laughs> it was a lot of fun running things at that time. Very unexpected, but pleasant. Where they went. Oh, okay. And, and the dates. Okay. Okay, so when you were in, uh, let's see, Luxembourg, you were in Wolf, Wolfrange? Is that how it's pronounced? Spell it. W E L F R A N G E? Wilfrange, yes. And there was another town that we By the Moselle River. Yes, well, there was another town here in Luxembourg, Trier. Okay. That our, that our battalion was spread over into those two, two places. Okay. All right. Uh, tell us about the bulge. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, when, see. That's, when that started, I think. I think I was in 
I was in France, right, or Belgium. Yeah, you have... Uh, what did I say, that it was in Belgium? 16 through 28 December, battalion holds southern hinge of the bulge by denying enemy crossing the strength of the Sour River, yeah. north east of Luxembourg City. Yeah, they were in that area, and it was starting to get very, got very cold and damp over there, mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so everybody was pretty much bundled up. And we said how our work to do, if they needed OP people, they'd take one from BC battery and one from A battery. Wherever we were needed, we mm -hmm. went out and we did. Mm -hmm. And was it and snowing? It was it started snowing. Yeah. Oh yes, and we started back down into into a, if you see the map there, and start we started down into a, into the bulge area, and uh, we wound up uh, on the Bastogne Highway. It was snowing like the devil, and uh, they were told by our, our battalion to keep shelling in certain areas mm -hmm. because. The German troops were coming through, and you could hear the tanks occasionally, and they also had ski troops, and they tried to get through. And there was one occasion where the battery next to us in South of Barbatania, this jeep come, come driving along with two guys in it in American uniforms. And it turned out that the driver was the only one who talked to our, to our people. When the roadblock was set up uh -huh. to, to stop the, the infiltrating, and this one group almost got through. The two other people with them couldn't speak English at all, and they, they were asking them questions like, do you know the New York Yankees, who's Babe Ruth, yeah. who's the President of the United States, you know, questions like that, trying to filter them out. And they immediately arrested them and took them away, uh -huh. according to the MPs that, that we knew mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, there was infiltrating going on. Now, were you working with the 101st Airborne at all? Is, what does it say in the book? I, do anything I about think the it says something about that, yeah. Yeah, they, they were there on the, on the Bastogne Highway, and the, yeah. and the, 80, and the, 80, the other 81st was in, what's the name of that battalion that the general said nuts, you did. He off. was with the 101st. He was in, inside. We were out attached to them, firing, shelling, and trying to stop the Germans yeah. from coming in. That was McAuliffe, I think, is the name. That's him, yeah. 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 Yes, we were attached to them for... Uh, Oh, I guess for, for a couple of weeks until I'd calm down, mm -hmm. and then we kept moving in. But that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Sleeping and sleeping in foxholes that were. Who knew? Maybe the Germans had them there before us, before we came along. We didn't mm -hmm. know. And there were huge pine trees, 30, 30, 25, and 30 feet tall, and the shelling into the pine trees would spread out down around all, all these guys that were exposed. Mm -hmm. And we were doing a lot of that on the. And these ski troops, ski troops that were coming out with the infantry behind them, uh -huh. and the tanks that they had coming over the hills there. It was a, like a, 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 what's the name of that burst? It, 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 it got it, it, near something or near a tree. A, like oh. an aerial burst, like a, around the Hurtigan Forest. Uh, they said that uh, a lot of guys were killed just by the, yes. the, the splinters. The splinters and right up in the trees and things yeah. like that. Yeah. And if it, if it got down and hit a tank, why? It was AP, uh, armor piercing was a one type of shell, mm -hmm. and this other one that I just mentioned to you. Okay. And it's difficult to... How many weeks were you sleeping out in the snow? What, dear? How, how many days or weeks were you sleeping out in the snow then? Oh, for quite a little, little over two weeks, I think, we were there in that area before they moved us out. There's a lot of mop mopping up to do, and they would would ask for fire in certain areas where there were pockets of Germans still around. Mm -hmm. And you were involved with the Battle of the Ardennes? That was, uh, it's like 31 December to the 4th of February? Yeah, in the Ardennes Forest, that's yeah. right, yes. Okay. Um, how close were, were the Germans to you? Um, being that you were out on, you know, in the for, forward observation post, they, you must have been pretty close to them, weren't you? Yes. Yes, and maybe the question of uh, maybe 300, 400 feet sometimes. Jeez. Yeah. You know, coming into 
other battalions should have picked the guys up before they got near us. Mm -hmm. well, we would, an infantry officer would call for fire, and he, he'd give the coordinates, and whoever was closest to them just lay down the barrage, mm -hmm. lay down the barrage, lay down the barrage, and you could say that. Mm -hmm. Being that close, did you have any problems with friendly fire? Your unit dropping shells in two too close to you guys? No, not to the best of my no. Not to the best of my knowledge. No. Okay. Yeah. You would hear about it, but you know, at times in other other areas or infantry outposts or something like that, but not us. Mm -hmm. No, we were fortunate. Mm -hmm. No. And uh, when you were in the foxholes, did you have any kind of cover or anything, or you were just constantly exposed to the the snow coming down on you? Branches from these big pine trees in the area, mm -hmm. we'd put them, cover the foxhole with, the, with these okay. branches. And you'd lay under it? And we'd lay under it. this as a, like a canopy uh -huh. a cover, yes. And that would keep the snow off us. Okay. But the minute you got out, we were out in the snow again. Huh. So that maybe <laughs> the honeymoon was very short at that <laughs> time. <laughs> and I know this might sound kind of odd or funny, but it must have been really tough if you guys had to relieve yourselves too in conditions like that. Oh well, yeah, I had to crawl out of the hole and go back somewhere in the trees. Uh-huh. And, and let, let your guys know where the hell you were going so somebody would take a shot at you. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Lord, yeah, oh really, yeah. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Did you, because you were in the observation post, and you got close to the Germans, did you ever confront any Germans yourself? No. No. So no. you you weren't involved with capturing Germans uh, or? <clears throat> let's see, there, there was one point, there was one, there was one occasion there shortly after the boats. It was where we were in February, we were where? February, <coughs> Says, in the Ardennes. Uh, okay. Right? Okay. In that Ardennes area, yeah, that would uh, Our battalion had pulled off the road or something, what they were doing, and we, had, we were split up. And uh, there was a rumor coming around that there were Germans in the area, and sure enough, they were there. And they come, come moving down out, out of this road. And uh, we were set up for them. We, some of the infantry men were with us. They set up the roadblock and so forth. Yeah, you know, they captured a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. But there's a story I don't think you've ever heard before. The jeeps were put together uh, on the front bumper, an inverted Y, with a post coming up straight out here. And that post had a little nose and three or four big cuts straight through. They would put a huge piece of piano wire across the road, particularly at night or you know, when it's getting dusk or something, mm -hmm. and it would take your head right off. Mm -hmm. And those that cut on that inverted Y and that uh, they the the brace on the front of the jeep, right, cut yeah. it right in half. Yeah, yeah. It was they were pretty successful at times. They tell me, but it word got around fast, and mm -hmm. the motor pools were like working double time to put these brackets up on front. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'll tell you, you never had much time to sleep. Mm -hmm. You had to stay alert all the time. <laughs> Now it says, uh, 4th of February, 1945, your battalion entered uh, Germany in the vicinity of uh, Aue, A-U-W, and uh, you were attacking the Siegfried Line yeah. at the Schnee Eiffel Forest. Yep. Okay. Is that where we crossed the Rhine? Uh, that was later on. Let's see, it says you crossed the Rhine 29 March, 29 March, 45. We were still back in February. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but that was later on. Yeah. So you were, you guys were basically stuck there through the, through the month of February. Yes, we were. In okay. Our yes, there was a lot of shelling going on in there, and there was a big group in the Ardennes or some kind of a castle or a fort in there, and uh, the Germans would, wouldn't surrender. Mm -hmm. So they just kept shelling this place and shelling this place until they destroyed it. Mm -hmm. And there were very few Germans came out of there. I think there must have been Gestapo people. They wouldn't, they wouldn't let their soldiers out. They wanted to stay there. Mm -hmm. Now, what rank were you at that point? PFC, always a private first class. Okay. 
And what about replacements? How often did you guys get replacements? If if somebody was wounded or if, if somebody had frostbite or? Uh, I, I know there were, but I don't know how many. Okay. Now, know. for for most of the time, were, were you with a single group of, of friends that you stayed with all the time? or? Yeah, pretty much as some fellas in, in, in our in A battery to communications group. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were a pretty tight knit group and okay. we hung around with one another and we we're always wondering where the hell is Johnny today or yeah. where, where did they send him? When, when do you think they're coming back? You know, what, what's their time frame? Yes. So you were in a, a platoon sized uh, yes, that's right. operation. Yep. Okay. Right. Now, what about, uh, well, after the bulge, when you guys came offline, did you get any kind of break or anything, or any kind of rest? Uh, that would be what, what month? Yes, we're still in February or are we in uh, March? Well, let's see, in, in March, on February, uh, 4th of February, you guys entered the uh, Germany in uh, attacking the uh, Siegfried Line. Yeah in the Schnee Eiffel Forest? Yeah. Okay. No, not much of a break, no. No, just The only break just we kept... got is when our teams were relieved from an okay. observation post. So you guys have kept moving forward? Just kept moving all the time. Okay. Do you want to talk about the day you saw Patton? Oh, that was the convoy thing. I that's forget a what funny story. It was. <laughs> well, was, was that after the bulge? You saw Patton or during the bulge? I think I think it was. Let's see now. It was cold. Or something. He was on, a, on a, an intersection with a, with all his officers and everybody was going, and, and there was a, a small kind of convoy moving up, mm -hmm. and he was like this, and he's giving the tanker this, get going, you know, the tanker. Oh, was he directing traffic? He, yeah, he, he, he had a, okay. he, he wanted to get out there himself because he wasn't satisfied with how uh -huh. fast it was moving. I, it was I think pretty that. Funny. I, think I, that, I drove right by him and I drove in a cheap with a lieutenant with me. Yeah, that was a great occasion. Yeah, they portrayed that I think in one of the movies. Yeah, yes, they did. That was quite yeah. a because that was quite a quite a deal at that sure. time. Yeah. Oh sure. Okay. Yeah, that was that was, that was fun. That was a nice relief. Everybody got a big kick out of that. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. What about uh, Koblenz and? Uh, Let's see, the Battle of Koblenz was uh, 15 through 22 March. And then right after that, you guys crossed the Rhine River, 29 March, 45. Yeah. Koblenz was, a, we were pretty busy, yes. Uh -huh. There was a lot of resistance in that area, then they were trying to stop us from you know, getting to the Rhine River to get across it. Mm -hmm. But finally, you know, we, to forget, what, what division were we with then? Uh, it, they started moving pretty Oh, quickly. you guys were with the. Uh, you supported the 11th Armored Division and the 17th Airborne Division and the 87th Infantry Division. Yeah. Yes. Then, then they started clearing that area up, and we they were trying to get across the Rhine. And there was the Infantry Division was was spearheading the crossing of the Rhine. Mm -hmm. and by the yeah, everybody read about them later on the Remagen Bridge. Had, Mm -hmm. got, well, we were south of the Remagen Bridgehead, and they were fighting like the devil. And the Germans wouldn't—they just wouldn't give up. They're not let us back into into, into into further into Germany. And eventually, we got word that we were going to cross. The, the uh, army engineers had put this pontoon bridge south of the Remagen Bridgehead, and we were going to be part of the group that was going to cross at that point. Uh huh. And that's how we crossed with the army engineers. Okay. Yes, our, our, our guns and so forth came later on, but there was enough distance we could get distance from with our guns a couple of miles in, so it wasn't really necessary to, have to try to get the guns across. Okay. All right. And that was uh, 29 March, and uh, let's see, 20. Next uh, entry is 22nd April. Uh, relieved assignment, 3rd United States Army, assigned 
first United States Army. Okay. And, and that was more or less a troop transfer. Mm -hmm. And we, we never got any word of that, whatever army we were attached to until later on. Okay. When, they, when we had a rest period, they said, they, okay, we're, we were doing this with this, with this army, 7th Army or 3rd Army or 1st Army, now mm -hmm. we're with so-and-so, but it didn't change what we were doing. Mm -hmm. it had no effect whatsoever on it. Okay. Then the next uh, entry, it says 7 May of 45, you were in Sten, Germany, and it says cease firing? Yeah. Did I tell you we were in Dachau? No, no, tell us, tell okay. us about that. Yeah. Dachau is in Poland, right? No, it's in, Dachau's in Germany. In Germany, okay. Mm -hmm. Before we got to this part where we were talking about, me, we, we were with a, attached to a tanker group, and they were, they were getting supplies, and then they had an airdrop for gas, and we're just way back that we're going to go into this, uh, into Daco. And uh, we pulled in there, along with the, at that time, a, 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 an English doctor with, with, a, with, a, with a unit, a, his own unit had pulled in there just ahead of us and they were treating these people. Mm -hmm. They were like toothpicks laying, mm -hmm. laying on these beds. 90% mm -hmm. of them were half dead at that time. It wasn't a very pleasant sight, you know, you're saying, you know, what the hell is going on? Mm -hmm. We were fighting, we find these poor people, here. these mm -hmm. poor bastards are dying at our feet. Mm -hmm. So whatever we had on the tanker's had, the doctor said to us, if you got any rations or anything, leave them here and we'll, we'll, distribute, we'll try to treat some of these people. Mm -hmm. That was not a very pleasant sight. No, no, and I heard that uh, there were boxcars with, with bodies in them. Yes, they were up on the hill. Mm -hmm. In fact, but if you look up on the hill in the pine trees, there was a big pit where they would take these bodies and just just uh, throw them in there. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of what, what's on it. It was a line. They'd cover them up with line. Mm -hmm. We took a little walk around there, and then we decided it's no place for us. We still have things we have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. there were box guys and people were in, laying in, laying in on, on the ground wherever they were when the Germans pulled out. They left everything there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, Seven May was the uh, Germany unconditional surrender was signed at. Uh, of a you, 141 you hours. Flip to the map. In the front? Yeah. You see where we are Czechoslovakia? By, yep. your, by your left thumb, see it? Yep. Right yep, in there. Right. Okay, there's a town called Zwaikow. Okay. And we were in Zwaikow when we got word, don't go any further, stay. Mm -hmm. The reason for us to stopping there was <clears throat> the Russians were coming. And we had to meet the Russians right, right there. I, I was going to ask you if you met the Russians. We did, right there, yes. In about two or three days. We stayed there so, uh, not too long, maybe four or five days. And some of the officers and the rest of the battalion came over. They were talking to these people. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were passing vodka around, and our officers were passing the good old, good old U.S. Scotch and rye around mm -hmm. to drink it with these people. So the Russians yes. were pretty Russians friendly. Were pretty friendly. Yes, they were. Uh -huh. yep. And that's the first time I had a... Had a, 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 a a glass of vodka. I don't think I could talk for ten minutes. <laughs> it burned all the way, all the way down. Well, that was pretty difficult. But that's where we stopped. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that was it. Uh -huh. Once, once the war ended, uh, was there any? Well, obviously there was some celebration there. Uh, just going back a little bit, uh, do you recall uh, hearing about? The death of President Roosevelt, that would have been the month before in April. Yes, the word spread pretty much around the battalion. Mm -hmm. Yes, it came down from headquarters. Everybody was notified. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure, FDR would do a great job. Yeah. Yeah. Good. He and Churchill, they did a wonderful job there. Mm -hmm. Okay. What happened once, once the war ended? Were there rumors that, that you guys might be sent over to the Pacific at all? Or? Yes, there were rumors. Mm -hmm. And there were different, we had heard that there were different infantry units that were being shipped out. Mm -hmm. But it didn't affect us. We, we were not in any way told that we weren't going to be needed. Let's just stick to our, our business and what we're doing and we'll start moving out little by little back into Germany. Mm -hmm. Yes, did you bring that picture? 
No. Oh, okay. We were doing. They took a group of us with the motor port, port sergeant. He picked a few, few, few guys that had some idea of the mechanics and driving. Myself was one of them. And we were given two and a half ton trucks. Uh huh. And they said, you go over to this area and you take these people back to Poland. We were all Polish women that were uh, labor. Mm -hmm. Prisoners were doing labor work for the Germans. And we'd load them up into these trucks and take them down maybe 30, 40 miles back across to the Polish border, whoever was nearest, and we'd, they, we'd just turn them loose. Mm -hmm. And I drew a little uh, two and a half ton truck, maybe maybe a week, 10 days, along with three or four of my friends, trying to get these people back to Poland out of these mm -hmm. labor camps. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then coming back, why uh, we stopped in some of these German towns and uh, occupied them for a while, and the headquarters would set up a switchboard and keep them in touch with headquarters because we were sped over, the battalion was sped over maybe an area ten, five or ten miles depending where we were. Mm -hmm. So they had communications all the time. Mm -hmm. How were you treated by the German people when the war ended? I didn't have a problem. They were glad to see me. They called me Lunsman. I still had a lot of light blonde hair. Uh -huh. Yeah. Lunsman, Lunsman. Uh -huh. well, you know, and they do. The kids wanted chocolate, uh -huh. you know, as, as, as to be expected. Sure. But I didn't have any problem. It never bothered me, no. You know? mm -hmm. But you always had your carbine on your shoulder, no matter uh -huh. where the hell you went. Yeah. All the time. Oh, yeah. And you didn't, nobody ventured out at night. Everybody's inside. They were assigned houses in these different towns and things mm -hmm. like that. And in the, in the, in the, in the area, like, I mean, the area where we really could walk to the best sergeant that set up kitchens. And there was plenty of hot food during that time. Yeah, that was pretty much the way it wound up until mm -hmm. we got back to ship out. Okay. Before you uh, shipped out, uh, did you uh, see any USO shows at all? Any? Oh yeah, Bob Hope. Oh, Nuremberg. did you? Nuremberg. In Nuremberg, yes. While we were waiting, yeah. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. And, and he had these old golf club that he gets. You see the movies with. Uh huh. Him? And what was the name of that gal? She could sing and dance, but it, was, it wasn't Dorothy. It wasn't Dorothy from board. It was one of those mm. not big U.S. Not McGuire, was it? No, no that, they, sisters. They, that was they a were later on, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was one of those gals okay. he had with him all the time. But that was a great show. Uh -huh. And it was Bob. You know, if you didn't get there soon enough while you were back in the hills and some guys had binoculars and wanted to get a good look at Hope, and he, he never stopped talking during the whole period. You know? uh -huh. Well, that was a big treat. That was great at that time. Huh. Oh, sure. Okay. When did you end up going back home? Uh, they had a point system set up. Uh huh. And I didn't have enough points to go back for a while because I didn't have much time in the in the states. And uh, the higher point people, they they started shipping them out. So I was I did some occupation duty maybe for. Uh, about a month or so in Germany, and then they shipped us out to uh, out to France, near a town called Avignon, mm -hmm. where they called the Palace of the Popes is in Avignon, France. And we did a lot of a lot of small things, duty around there, talking to the French people, and just keeping out of trouble. Uh -huh. Really, they, they warned us, you know, <laughs> if you want to get out of here and get on that boat pretty soon, you guys stay out of trouble. So wherever you go, you go together. There's at least two. Nobody out alone. Not even in France. There's not, you know, because some of the French were not the best, best people uh -huh. as far as the Americans were concerned. They'd pat you on the back and then a minute later they'd, you know, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know what the hell to do with okay. Those things did happen. Yes, it did happen. Okay. Then we finally got out of boat out of uh, Marseille. Same boat. Well, uh, let's see. Do you do you recall when you left France? Let's when see. I went to France? No, when you when you left France. Well, uh, when you left, was the was the war in the Pacific over with, or was was that no, still, it was still going on? It was still going on. Okay. 
Yeah. That ended in uh, August of 45, so so I'm, I'm guessing maybe you came back to the States in June? In June, maybe June, maybe June. Or July? Yeah. Okay. All right. And you were discharged from there? Yeah, I went uh, out of Fort Dix, okay. New Jersey. Yeah. Okay. Do you, rec uh, you have down here, you were, of course, discharged in 45. Do you re recall what month? Was it, was it, must have been as soon as you got back? It was as soon as I got back, okay. a matter of days, yes. Okay. Yeah. It was a big, big depot, and they were just everybody out. Mm -hmm. They were trying to get everybody to re-listen, of course. You know, how to go listen to an orientation program, and this or that, you've got this, you've got that. We need these people, we need those type of people. You fell on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That was it. No. So you were discharged. Uh, did you get on a train and head for home? Yes. I trained right into, a, into New York. Mm -hmm. Got on a, a New Haven train which was uh, on the, uh, the Grand Central to New Haven. Mm -hmm. And one of the stops was Rye. And there one of the local police officers met me when I was getting off the, uh, getting off the train. We were for my dad, the chief of police. Oh, okay. And it, it, was a, it was a kind of a bittersweet thing. There's Officer Ellingham there. And his son George was killed. He was a medic oh. in the Battle of the Bulge. He was a pal of mine. And there's the father standing waiting for me. And they got the biggest bear hook you've ever seen from this big tall cop, mm -hmm. Dick Bellingham. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was very emotional at that time. So you went home. Did you, uh, did you make use of that uh, 5220 club? Yeah. Okay. I did for, for a while. Yeah. Okay. I think maybe through through the summer and then the fall, I went off to managed to get into a college under the GI Bill. All right. And uh, what college was that? Uh, Kent Kent State University in you know in Ohio. Oh, okay. You went to yeah. Kent State. And did you graduate from? No, only two years. Okay. I went to courses later on after my my girlfriend and I were married up, up in Connecticut. Uh, what the hell was the name of that college? It was, it was a, a division of Connecticut, Connecticut College, about, uh, yeah. about 30 miles or 3 miles northeast of Rye along the coast. Okay. We drive up there and take courses for them. Yeah. Okay. And once you finished your, your schooling, obviously you went to work? Yeah. And, and what, uh, what type of work did you do? I worked for uh, uh, the New York Telephone Company. Didn't you work for the bus company first? We uh, first, that's right, fall back. In the New York City and in the Bronx area, there were still trolley cars mm -hmm. around and buses. There was a, a bus company called Surface Transportation. And I went to work for the Yonkers Railroad, which was part of Surface Transportation. It was a trolley car company. And we started working for them as, a, as an investigator checking on accidents and things of that mm -hmm. nature. And then the surface transportation decided that they were going to uh, team up with the, with the Fifth Avenue coach lines. And it was called Mabtosa, Manhattan Operating Bronx, I think it was, it was a big unit. It was, it was a good good company to work for, surface transportation. You know, they had a, a the big building on uh, East 126th Street and uh, First Avenue, mm -hmm. where there was a huge uh, barn, bus bus depot, and they had the, the claim and legal division upstairs over that. And I worked out of that building for a couple of years before I went over to the phone company. We were on trial on a big case in the Bronx, and we were co-defendants with the telephone company. And I was called in to testify in some of the investigation and statements I had on the case. And it turned out we did very well, and the, and, and the phone company won the case. Mm -hmm. And this uh, big, heavy set Irishman by the name of Donahue, the trial, the, the trial the lawyer for the t telephone for the, uh, for the telephone company, come over to me after the trial. He says, hey. We can use you. We need a guy with your experience. So that's how I wound up in a telephone company about three weeks later after I yeah. had took all their tests and their physicals and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. 
Yeah. As it so happened, two other fellas I worked with at that bus company uh, transferred with me within a couple of weeks. One of the fellas is still still alive today over in Rockland County. They one of my good friends for a long time. Okay. Did you end up retiring from the telephone company? Yes. Okay. What year did you retire? 19... Was it 1990? 1980. You know that stuff. Hold on. Give me a minute. Well, you were still working when I got married, right? Yeah. That was 79. So. I think it, I think it might have been 90. No, I think it was more like 80. It was what, 80? Yeah. Were you I had 28 in some years. Okay. Yeah. On with them. Yeah, it was it was around that time. Yeah. Okay. And what? I probably shouldn't ask ask you this because a lot of guys don't remember. But you recall when you got married? Oh sure. The hottest day of the year in July, in July the second. Yeah, it was in 1950. Okay. Because every two years for a while we would plan on having having children. Okay. And how many and children? Barb, we have five, and Barb was the oldest. Five. Yeah, I was the oldest. Oh yeah. Okay, and I suppose you have. And a we lived in Rye. We had a, a nice house. Everybody got along, and it, mm -hmm. it was down the street from Rye High School. <clears throat> the Fork Hill School was another block away, and the church was behind that. So everything was accessible to whatever you wanted to do. And Playland, the big amusement park, was over in Long Island Sound, about down about a mile street. away. Mm -hmm. So I imagine you have a whole slew of grandchildren too. How about 11? 11, okay. Yeah. And did you join any uh, veterans organizations? Oh yeah, I belong to the American Legion Post 128 in New York. All right. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? I, I think prior, prior to the service, I think there were times that you, could, you got a little carefree with things that things that you did or wanted to do. You you became a little more respectful of what you had mm -hmm. and appreciated more than you did probably before. Before okay. the circumstances. Okay. Uh, before we close, is there an, anything else you'd you'd like to add? You, you remember, you were, who was the best driver? Oh, oh. <laughs> and we had a, um, there were cats that were pulling these guns, and he worked mostly out of the motor pool, and his name was Jim Golden, and he didn't have a right thumb, which was pretty well unusual for a guy handling these big cats in huge trucks. Mm -hmm. He used them somewhere out in Pennsylvania, and he was a great, great friend during the time we were in there in the Army with him. If we needed something, I know right, right to go to him for anything that we needed for our jeep to the motor pool. He was, he was a good guy, but that, always remember he didn't have a right thumb. Mm -hmm. So I kidded him one day, he said, how the hell did you manage to get in the Army? He, says, he said, I, they were going to draft me, but then my father knew the head of the draft board, and even with this missing, they took me anyhow, because the old man wanted to get rid of him, I think. <laughs> 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 That's true, true story, he had no, no right thumb. Okay. That's funny. All right, well, thank you so much for your interview. Oh, you're welcome. Well, too bad I couldn't think of a few other Oh, no, about, you did an excellent job. What about the guy from the Bronx that was in your unit? Well, McDonald. Yeah, he got wounded one day in shelling. I forgot that. Yeah, he, we got, just took some shells in the air in the battalion area, and uh, he happened to be out running for cover or something like that. He took a piece of it. Shell right over here, the side of his cheek was all cut up, and he still had part of the scarring when I, when I ran into him a year or two later in that amusement park in Rye called Playland. Uh -huh. He would like to come up there and walk and with his two kids, and we stop and we talk every once in a while. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen him in a number of years, no. Mm -hmm. Now uh, you mentioned uh, joining the veterans organization. I forgot to ask you, did you ever go to any uh, any reunions at all? Um, no, our organization never set up a reunion and never heard okay. very little about them, no. Okay. I don't know. Because there weren't that many people around that area from 
from the, where, where I lived in Rock. Mm -hmm. They were out from the Midwest to Tennessee and those areas. And some of these fellows did, still couldn't read or write when it came to the payroll. The first sergeant would take their hand and have them give them a mark <laughs> and then shell out the money so who knew uh -huh. what was happening there. But he had a, we had a whole gang of those people from the area. Oh. Yeah, one, one fellow used to run around and, and if you have uh, looking for uh, after shave lotion, he would drink the after shave lotion. Oh, jeez. Yeah, there were all kinds of characters in this. <laughs> Let me tell you, but there weren't in our communications group, they were cannoneers. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and didn't nice. you say your group, when you went to basic training, you were all mostly replacements, correct? Well, from there, yeah, we replaced, they sent us out to different places. Like I went to Chaffee with the 81st, yeah. Yeah, that's why they get built, mm -hmm. yeah. spread out. Oh, yeah. Okay. None of them were lined up, and it was me in, the, in did, Camp Chaffee with the 81st. Did anybody from Rye get drafted when you did? Oh, yeah, a lot of people get drafted, but not with me. Not with you? Not with me. No. They were friends. mostly older. I was one of the youngest guys around. You want to tell them about the time you got the, you got a little cut? I got what? You got a little injury on your forehead? Oh, that was, that was near the end of the war. It was just a Band-Aid. Somebody threw a grenade and knocked my helmet off. And I had a little scratch here. It was after the war was over. They were fooling around. Oh, you know, some guys start horsing around? Yeah. And the medic just put a huge Band-Aid on here. He said, see you later, but <laughs> <laughs> No purple heart. I tried heart. to cash in on it later on. Yeah. They, had, they had no record of it. Oh, OK. They acknowledged it. They checked into the records of the a battery or the 81st, no mention of it. Uh -huh. oh, okay, well, I'm fine. <laughs> Forget it. I'm home. Well, thank you for your time. Oh. I, I hope I was a little help to get oh, You were excellent. Probably nice job. Before, but. All right, well, thank you so much. If you, get, if you get time sometime in there, there's a little paragraph in there, I think it says, the friend of the infantryman, mm -hmm. in one of those commendations we got from that, the colonels and the generals and so forth. A lot, we have a lot of commendations on this. We're a pretty sure fired group. Mm -hmm. Dependable. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you again. Okay. Do I have to turn in my pass now to get out the door? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're, you're, you're fine. You're not a prisoner. <laughs> you're not a prisoner. Good.